So Kevin, it's great to have you here. We're sitting in, I guess, what I call the library of my office. And um, uh, I guess uh, where we should start, because this is our friends eavesdropping on our conversation, is why don't you tell the listeners how we met might be a good start. Sure. Well, thanks for having me. It's uh, really amazing to be here. And uh, the place we met was in a, in a tower off the University of Zurich. And it was at a, an event uh, where a bunch of academics, uh, one of which was me, were giving presentations on different aspects of the dark universe. And I talked about uh, supermassive black holes. And uh, I gave my presentation. And afterwards, there was a, a, a dinner where the speakers and the attendees could, uh, could meet and interact. And that's where we met. And actually, we started talking about Twitter followers. And you just told me that, that you, you'd recently gained a whole bunch. <laughs> yeah, I've gained quite a few more. I'm quite surprised at the number of Twitter followers I have, but I think that you're better than me at this point. No, I, I don't think so. And <laughs> I've, I've pretty much I, I've, I've stopped um, doing too much active work on Twitter. Uh, it's just become so depressing to look into that part of the world. Well, um, there's another episode where I, I talk about the many things I've learned on Twitter uh, from people like Naval, at mm -hmm. N-A-V-A-L. But um, uh, uh, so I'm going to start with where's most interesting for me is that uh, you're a student at Corn Cornell University. And interestingly enough, that's somewhere that my daughter is very interested in going to. Uh, and you grew up in Switzerland and Germany. So how did you end up at Cornell University? You know, when, when people ask me that, they, they, they think this is a so, sort of interesting story there. But it's, it's very, mon very simple and, and fairly random. So I, um, I grew up in Switzerland. I grew up in Germany. And then I went to school in the UK. And I just decided uh, I didn't want to stay in the UK for university. So I looked around and um, I decided that actually the place to be is this late 90s, early 2000s, the place to be was the US. This is where you had to go if you, if you wanted to, to do something great. And so I just applied to American universities and Cornell was one of the ones that admitted me. And that, that's it. Uh, I don't know much about Cornell. It's, it's got an extraordinary reputation, but it's kind of the majority of universities with extraordinary reputations are in big cities, Boston, New York, you know, or our Palo Alto is least close to San Francisco. Whereas this, Cornell is really kind of, it feels far away to me. It's a, what, a six hour drive from New York City. Uh, what, tell me a little bit about the history of Cornell and what makes it such a great institution. So it's got a, actually a really interesting history. So it's very different from the traditional old New England or Ivy League universities or even places like Stanford in that it's uh, started as a land grant university. So it had a, a public part and, and then a private part. And the land grant meant that it had to be upstate New York. It couldn't be in New York City or, or, or a place like that. And the, the founder of the university, a guy called Ezra Cornell, he, he chose as the university's motto that any person could find instruction in, in any field of study there. And they were very serious about that. And so Cornell actually had um, many, many firsts in terms of being open to people from different backgrounds, different religions back then also and also teaching very practical subjects, agriculture, hospitality, engineering, and not just the, the, the humanities and the sciences. Yeah, it's really interesting. So, you know, I've been learning about it, and I have no idea how my daughter found her way to it, but she has a strong interest in Cornell, and I think that's fascinating. But So then you ended up at some point in your career at Balliol College in Oxford, and if I'm not mistaken, you you and the British Prime Minister were at Balliol. Maybe you were at the, you were contemporaries. How does one end up going from Cornell to Balliol? But also tell me, I didn't know that you'd been at school in the UK. Tell me a little bit about that. Again, it it, it it's not a particularly fascinating story. Is the a friend of a relative had done that, gone to school in the UK at the time, and told me about it, and I sounded like a, a good idea. I looked into it and I said, yes, that's what, what I want to do. Um, and then to go back to, okay, how did I end up back at, in, in Oxford? So when it came towards uh, graduating from university, I said, I, I wanted to do a PhD. 
I want to do a PhD in astrophysics. And in, in the US, PhD is actually a very long-term project. So five years is extremely fast. More common is six or even seven years. And then I remembered that back in the UK, PhDs were funded for three years. If you took longer, I mean, you could, but that's it. You were pretty much out the door. And that sounded appealing to me just sort of on an entrepreneurial basis, like, let's get it done. And so I applied and I got a position at Oxford. And then uh, after handing in my PhD thesis uh, after three years, um, I got a fellowship to stay on there for a little while. And so I was a fellow at Balliol College for about a year. Yeah. And um, Balliol at my time at Oxford was... So a guy called Joseph Raz was there, but it was also kind of a center of sort of socialist left-wing political ideology. If you went to Balliol, you were kind of considered to be, if you weren't of that bent, you were exposed to that heavily. Was that the case for you or were you completely oblivious to it because you were in the sciences? I mean, I have, I have to admit, I, I, was, I was aware of it in a very general sense, but I don't think I ever got into any political discussion with anyone there because I was too interested to learn about the, their research, their science, what they were doing. And yeah. so I, I was mostly oblivious. Mostly oblivious. And so tell us a little bit about your PhD topic or your topic of specialization in astrophysics. Mm -hmm. So I, I started studying the evolution of a particular type of galaxy called early type or elliptical galaxies. And so these are galaxies that look very different from our own Milky Way, which is sort of this spiral disk of stars with active growth, new stars forming all the time. There's a second type um, that is more like a football or a rugby ball in shape. And for the most part, they, they only consist of dead stars, of aging stars. And it's clear that the universe had to turn our Milky Way type galaxies into that other type somehow, in some fundamental way. And there were many mechanisms proposed, but it was a very difficult problem to crack because we couldn't just wait for a billion years and see what happened to a galaxy as beyond the length of any PhD, even in, in America. Um, and so I try to come up with clever statistical methods to uh, time this process and sort of put galaxies on the timeline, like how do I get from A to B? And the popular theory at the, at the time was that what's essential in driving this transition, this change, was the supermassive black hole. So every galaxy that we know of, every galaxy that we've measured, has a supermassive black hole somewhere between... 100,000 times the mass of the sun to maybe 10 billion times the mass of the sun at its center. And normally a black hole is just that. It's black. You, you can't see it. You can only infer that it is there from, the say, the movement of stars in the very center around it, which actually just got the Nobel Prize. Um, but when matter, when, when gas or even stars themselves fall into the black hole, uh, this engine switches on and through... Uh, the, the, the gain in energy or the loss in energy, depending on how you look at it, from falling into the black hole. So much energy is released that these supermassive black holes can outshine 100 billion stars put together. So the center of the galaxy, the nucleus, can be brighter than a whole galaxy. Call this by many different names, but uh, probably the most common one is a quasar. And so it was believed that this uh, quasar phase in the black hole is really active that that was somehow essential in this transition process, that it would blow out all the gas and dust that could form into new stars and therefore end the formation of new stars in these galaxies and therefore turn them uh, red and dead, as, as we call them. It's just, so, you know, you, you take me into a world that um, it's, it's hard for me, so you're going to have to help me here because I could literally, Kevin, uh, I could spend like four or five hours asking you these things. In fact... Uh, for the listener, what is interesting, what is so much fun for me in this is that I get to dive into questions that normally I wouldn't feel comfortable asking you because, because you know, life moves on. And by the way, uh, you, as you will probably read from show notes, uh, Kevin is no longer a professional astronomer. He's a professional entrepreneur. So I do want to get onto that, but I'm going to indulge myself and dive into this a little bit. So... Um, one thing that is is just so um, Nassim Taleb talks about extremistan versus mediocristan. We live in a world of you know other than a few things like wealth, 
Uh, most things that we see experience in our world are mediocristan, things tend towards the average, but you just talked about a supermassive black hole that could be 100,000 times uh, the matter of the sun to te 10, uh, 10 billion, did you say? Yeah, I think the most massive ones are sort of around 10 billion, give or take a few. And, and that is just a, a world of extremistan, which is just extraordinary. And um, obviously, the our experience of what feels like physics to us is happening in such a some of such a limited range and you've spent your life or did spend your life looking at what happens in extreme circumstances that we don't experience but just to our, just to sort of for my benefit and we're never going to get to a proper scientific understanding kevin and i don't have any notes kevin could write stuff up on boards and charts but so as matter falls into the black hole it releases energy mm -hmm. It releases energy because its potential energy is declining as it goes into the hole? Essentially, yeah, its potential energy is converted into something else. And basically what happens, uh, because there's also the question of angular momentum, so the material forms like a disk of material around right. the black hole. Not, not dissimilar to watching water go down a drain. Mm -hmm. And then the material in this disk um, has some friction against itself. And so all this potential energy is essentially used converted to, to, heat. to convert it to heat. And it gets so hot that it can uh, glow uh, much uh, hotter, actually, even than a star. Okay, so there's, there's processes which turn it into a circulating disk, which is gradually or maybe um, rapidly being pulled in. And um, so it's not quite the same as a meteorite going through the Earth's atmosphere, but one could think in an analogous way part of what's being generated is just heat energy through friction. Mm -hmm. And we know that there's that famous photograph that was published recently of a black hole, and what you see is a kind of a halo, mm -hmm. and that is effectively what you're talking about. Now, inside the halo is dark, so that's inside the event horizon. Is that right? So it's not even inside the horizon, because the horizon itself you also can't see, because right. it's already the point of no return. Yeah. But, but when we look at that, that mm -hmm. famous photograph, um, is the part that's dark, can we assume that that's inside the event horizon and what we're seeing around the edges is the edge of the event horizon? So it's not necessarily specifically the edge. It's the closest material that is around that, those particular right. black holes. So it, it could be, it, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think it's very close the event horizon, but it's not exactly at it. So I have a, a question that's bothered me for a long time is, you know, I read popular science from time to time. Actually, the one that I like the most is New Scientist, believe it or not. It's just easy for me, uh, even though a lot of it, I'm sure, gets you angry because it's written by people who perhaps don't understand the science well enough. But so I've read about Hawking radiation, and I can understand that if you have um, across the event horizon, you could have uh, a particle, and the particle might, f for quantum reasons, might be probabilistically on one side or the other of the event horizon. And if uh, energy from the particle is sucked into the event horizon, then there's something that might happen on the other side. Is that the same? So that that is Hawking radiation, if I understood correctly. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I guess that what you're talking about is is matter that's further out from the event horizon that is just heating up massively because of what we described, the frictional effects of falling into the black hole effectively. Yeah, so, so Hawking radiation is, is a, an extremely slow phenomenon. And actually, we, we've never seen Hawking radiation. It's a, it's a theoretical idea. Right. Um, the material that we see glow at this incredible level is, is a little bit further out. So if maybe the, the black hole is the size of the orbit of the Earth. The material might be coming out from the scale of the outer planets or something yeah. like that all the way to the outer solar system. So it's that kind of scale that, that we should keep in mind. But just to go back to your original question, what you did your PhD thesis on, we live in a spiral galaxy, a galaxy that for one reason or another um, has these kind of arms. And for there's some physical reason why the, the, the sun's uh, the stars that we get form these arms, and then you've you've talked about a different kind of galaxy, which is rugby shaped, and so these supermassive black holes have some role in converting a galaxy that looks like ours to one of those rugby shaped galaxies. 
So we can we can paint a scenario of the most likely way this happens, and I think this is not a settled question even even today. But um, the story would look something like this: so the nearest big galaxy to us is the Andromeda galaxy, which actually, on a really dark night, you can see with your own eye. It's uh, another spiral galaxy. It's actually more massive. It's bigger than the Milky Way, and it's the only galaxy that's heading towards us. And we know that in the next couple billion years. The Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy, they will collide and merge. So when you have two galaxies colliding and merging, you can disturb the orbits of all these stars that previously were in a nice spiral disk shape, and you get this unordered fuzzy ball of stars. So that we would call um, an early type or elliptical galaxy. But both of these galaxies, as they are right now, they're full of gas and stars that will fuel the formation of new stars. So somehow we have to get rid of all that gas and stars. And the idea is the, the hypothesis is that when the two black holes have merged, so now there's only one galaxy and one black hole, all this gas and dust will fall to the center, feed the black hole and light it up into a powerful quasar. And so much energy is liberated by this material falling in and the black hole shining so tremendously that the gas and dust gets swept away and gets heated and thrown out of this new galaxy. And then that's it. All you have left is... Right. A spheroid of dead stars. So it's a bit like a supernova on a, on a star where, where at a certain point in the life cycle of the star, all that excess matter gets sort of blasted away. Which, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's just it, the, 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 the whole, you know, I, it's just mind boggling to anyone, I think. And um, uh, you sort of lived in this world. <laughs> I still can't get my head around. I, I, so I know if I go into three dimensions, it's been explained to me that if we imagine that space is expanding and we imagine a balloon, and even though the balloon started as a point, if we sit on the surface of the balloon, we can't point to the origin because the balloon is expanding. And uh, if it was a point anywhere that we point to would be the origin, which is why the um, that original radiation that we have is coming from everywhere, but I still can't quite, quite get my head around the fact that, you know, I feel like if there was a Big Bang, we ought to be able to point to where the Big Bang started. Was it to my left or to my right? And this idea that it's kind of <laughs> very frustrating. So, yeah. Well, I, I think um, part, part of the reason why uh, we have the wrong mental image here is because Fred Hoyle, called it the Big Bang, actually, to make fun of it. He thought it was a ridiculous idea come, that creationists came up with to, to bring Genesis back into cosmology. And it was a beginning. And he, he thought it was absurd and called it the Big Bang to, to mock it. And, of course, a Big Bang is an explosion. And all the explosions we are familiar with, they, they come from a center. They come from a bomb or from whatever it is that's exploding. And, and that's entirely the wrong image to, to tie what happened in the early universe to. And so I, I think the origin of the confusion is, is, is in that naming. So what would be a better naming, actually? You know, I've, I've thought about this. I, I'm, I haven't come up with, with a good one. And I think it, it might be quite tricky because I, I try to think of what process in sort of daily experience is most like it, and I couldn't come up with a good example. I'm sure there's a good science communicator out there who's thought of a better analogy. But, but it's not an explosion. Not an explosion. But it is a point source. I mean, it, I mean I'm imagining that, that all of this happened, sort of, you know, it came from a point source. Well, no, because a, a, a mathematical point would be a singularity, and, and that is not what happened or we cannot say that that's what happened in the right. very earliest moment because right. it's forbidden by, by the laws of physics. So something was there. It always had or at least a finite size. The, 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 so in any case, so I, I have, I'm going to go somewhere else. Um, so in order to study this stuff properly, you obviously needed to know quantum, need to know quantum mechanics. And um, so people like me spend time with uh, Richard Feynman and um, you know, if you know, I, I just love the statement by him where he says, "If you're not deeply disturbed by quantum mechanics, then you don't understand it." 
which is just a spectacular, spectacular thought. So, you know, all I can do, I, I, you know, I can vaguely understand a probability function. Uh, you know, I can, I can get that. But um, do you walk around having studied quantum mechanics and probably being able to do the mathematics of quantum mechanics, do you walk around deeply disturbed by these, what mm -hmm. Richard Feynman said? So, so this is actually a, a, a kind of analogous problem. So, yeah, I, I mean, we can do the math, we can do the calculations. Some of them are really, really hard. Um, but we can do them and they work. They work amazingly well. So yeah, it's a but really in, good theory. In the construction of semiconductors, yeah. you use the quantum mechanics to decide the probability of where the electron will be and you design it around those quantum mechanical equations. So, so it's, the, it's very precise. Yeah, it, it is. And, and the challenge in the being deeply disturbed by it comes from the fact of how do you translate the mathematics that you can make, uh, that you can interpret into mental images that are useful to us. And uh, like with the, the Big Bang, with quantum mechanics, there is really no analog in our daily experience to quantum processes because the, the macroscopic world just doesn't behave in, in the same way. There's no, there's no good analogies you can draw. And so there are different schools of thought of how to interpret quantum mechanics in terms of what is actually going on, what mental image should you have in mind while you look at quantum mechanics. And the, the sort of prevalent um, interpretation, the one that's sort of taught at least as the first one in many courses, the one that probably Feynman was thinking about at the time, is the Copenhagen interpretation, w which essentially boils down to that famous cartoon where you know, this, the scientists are drawing formulae on a whiteboard. And it's, it's very complicated, but one of the steps is, and then magic happens. And so the Copenhagen interpretation for, for many people, certainly for me, has this sort of moment, like, don't question it, like magic happens, just, this is how it is. And, and that is disturbing. Um, and the, 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 my reaction to that is when I do think about this is that that almost certainly is the, the, the wrong interpretation, the wrong mental image of what's really happening. And, and there are other models that explain these images better. And the one that I personally like the the most, though I'm by far from an expert in it, is the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. That there's just no magic, but there's a very large number or maybe infinite number of alternate universes that correspond to this probability density function that, that you mentioned. And um, you can counter that and say, well, that, that, that's not parsimonious, that's crazy. How can you talk about infinite parallel universes? It sounds crazy. Um, but it's actually, in, in many ways, makes sense of reality. And that's what makes it, for my, for my perspective, a, an appealing theory. So that reminds me, that brings us, loops us briefly back to the world of Twitter. What I've learned is that Twitter is, it, is the absolute best when you forget about tweeting links, forget about reacting to stuff, but you can get, so we had a Twitter interaction, Kevin, where I asked you this question, and I'm now going to ask it to you now because you gave a very short answer on Twitter and I can give a longer answer. So my question about the many worlds interpretation, which for the listener, you know, in case you think that I know much about this, I've tried to read books about the topic and I really just understand the word many worlds, is that does not that not violate uh, the second law of thermodynamics or the first law that... Um, that energy is preserved. I find it very hard to understand how you can have in many worlds an energy to be preserved because it feels like there's infinite amounts of worlds that have been created and where do they actually exist? So uh, just, to, just to ground us a little bit, why don't you just start explaining by what my layperson concerns are around mm -hmm. laws of thermodynamics and preservation of energy and, and then tell me why I'm not, I shouldn't be as worried as I am. <laughs> right. So uh, the laws of thermodynamics basically describe how energy or heat, those are the same thing, how uh, in certain systems, how they act and react to what happens. And the, the most basic one is that energy is conserved. It's neither created nor destroyed. So uh, it's another way of saying you can't have something for free. Uh, you can't have a perpetual motion machine. It, it violates uh, this conservation of energy. Um, and the second law of thermodynamics is that uh, entropy always increases. And entropy is similar to the 
everyday concept of disorder or, or, or chaos. So these are also loaded words, so we have to be, be careful here. But basically the idea is that you, you, can, uh, uh, you can put your milk in the coffee, but you cannot reverse that because the entropy has increased because the two liquids have now uh, in, merged, have, have mixed, and undoing that would take a lot more energy than simply pouring the milk in. I want to interject here because there's something that I just want to help the listener with in case you're thinking this. So uh, the entropy goes up in the universe, but there are small areas of the universe where entropy goes down, where order is created. So we live in a world where we see an enormous amount of order. What we need to understand is that, that we are being irradiated by the sun. We're kind of in a very specific part of the universe where in many cases, order is being created, but that is not true of the vast majority of the universe. Again, it's this anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic view in which our personal experience does not correspond to the yes. reality. So entropy is going up, even though in, when, when you see a child grow up to be an adult, in that particular place, en entropy is going down. But continue. So you've actually just answered your own question, which is that there's a, a clause that's almost always left out in... Uh, when people object based on thermodynamics, which is that these things apply to a closed system. So the Earth is not a closed system um, energetically, because as you said, the sun is irradiating us and radiation also can escape, right? The, the Earth gives off heat. So um, both the conservation, uh, so the, the increase in entropy that, that always increases, that is only true in a closed system uh, thermodynamically. The, the first question about conserving energy, again, um, applies only in, in, a, in a system that is well described in, in this sort of closed sense because the moment you have the sun pumping in energy and you call the earth your system it's no longer conserved actually it increases over time um, and so when we talk about these parallel universes that in some sense exist or ha have a reality these are not part of your closed system they're not part of your nice experimental box where these laws apply. They're not meant to apply to situations like that. Um, another way to maybe approach the problem is to think about what conservation of energy uh, really means. Its origin is essentially, as a conservation law, is an origin of symmetry. Like all conservation laws, whether it be energy or momentum or, or whatever, these correspond to symmetries. And if a system that you're describing doesn't have that symmetry, then you don't have the conservation law. Or you don't have the complete description. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think I understand what the Copenhagen interpretation is. And, you know, I, I guess I just want to, this is, this is dangerous because we could spend hours on this. So at some point through your eyebrows or something, we're going to move on to more um, worldly topics, if you like. But, um, you know, is the cat alive or dead? <laughs> <laughs> so in the Copen and, yeah in the Copenhagen interpretation it, the answer is it's both and and that's just such a deeply unsatisfactory answer that the more the more you probe it the less sense it makes and and there's a there's an idea that I I try to get my head around but that there are people and there's there's a lot of there's there's quite a bit of quackery going on around quantum mechanics and the observer and this idea of um, consciousness mm -hmm. and the observer, because because the the observer, at least in the Copenhagen interpretation, is so important, and they've done these experiments that I can't remember, but I just remember reading about them. Where, and you know, they try to separate: is it is it the observation machinery? Is it the mind of the observer? What is it that causes the collapse in the probability? density function of whatever it is that you're trying to look at. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I think the, the origin of a lot of the confusion is terminology because we call it the observer. But of course, what the physicists meant by observer was not conscious human being or conscious living creature. What they meant is measurement device like a photon interacting with the system. So the moment the photon has to interact with the system, it has to give you uh, a reaction one way or the other, and that, that's the, the act of measurement, that's the act of observing. It, it ne was never meant to refer to there being a, a mind behind that. Yeah. So, so you know, we're not going to solve it here, but I'm going to dive into something else that has been bothering me, and I, 
again, I've been reading about it in New Scientist, but, um, and, and I don't even want to start, I'm not going to go here into uh, quantum computing, because what I learned from my last attempt is that, you know, I more or less understand what a logic gate is, and it's amazing to see how logic gates work. And what I understand from the quantum computing world is that, you know, there are different kinds of logic that apply. So you're not going to construct the same uh, circuitry, if you like, for a quantum computer. But, um, you know, we've all read now in popular articles about this idea of entanglement. And I understand that, uh, the, well, I, I, I understand that um, it's not like, you know, two in, entangled particles, which are now a real distance away, it's not that measuring one causes the other. It's that they're, they, they've shown through statistics that, it, that it's just that it's the collapse. It's, so, so it's not like information is moving across the distance between the two instantaneously. But, but I still am just so bothered by how, um, how these things can be related across non-quantum distances in a quantum way. I mean, it's even to me with limited understanding, that is very disturbing. I, I mean, I, I agree it is. I think I, I, I felt disturbed by this as well. And I felt less disturbed the moment I looked at it from the many worlds perspective, which is that there are universes uh, where, where it's one way and a universe where it's the other way. And, uh, and, and you eventually resolve that. And it, it was never different. So um, I, I feel like a lot of the, the disturbance that, that you feel, that I feel, is due to us having an incomplete or bad dis you know, human-scale description of what's happening. But so I, I have this idea with, and I, know I have to move on in a minute because, I don't know, the listener will get bored, but um, I have this idea that you, we can't constantly be splitting into yet another universe with a whole new set of books on the wall and a whole, you know, many infinite mm -hmm. versions of Kevin and infinite versions of Guy. So what does that really mean? I mean, that seems to be, it seems like matter multiplying out of all proportions. So what does it actually mean? I mean, it's, so the, this is, this is a reasonable critique and it's basically saying the, uh, you know, in physicists speak, the theory is not parsimonious. So it's, it's essentially, uh, it's very wasteful in trying to explain uh, nature. And I think the, the, I mean, I don't want to speak for the many worlds proponents because I am somebody who, who likes the theory, but I'm not some, somebody putting it forward. I, I would put it like this. Um, it, it's a perfectly uh, consistent outcome of the theory. Like if, if, you look the, if you look at the world this way, none of the math is wrong. None of the things that you do are wrong. And so I think what they would say is that um, you may think it's not parsimonious, but it is actually a, a consequence of a theory. Um, where is the other worlds? The worlds that didn't have the one. So we go into one of the parallel universes. Where are the other ones? Where to you know, point to it? Damn it! <laughs> I know. Yes. Um, I, I, there are some questions that uh, I think may never have the kind of satisfactory answer that we want, and I think. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of a, a quote that's been ascribed to various famous scientists, famous physicists, which is that the universe is under no obligation to make sense. Only graduate students are. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly right. So I'm going to dive into another topic of a great um, confusion and difficulty for me. Because, so I'm 54 years old. Uh, you know, I realize that... Uh, you know, it's like, I really do ask myself the question, at some point, I'm through more than half of my life, I will leave the universe, and I, I, or I as a conscious being will cease to exist. And then the question is, for just my pleasure or my satisfaction, what do I want to have understood? You know, do, do, you know, I can get through the rest of my life not understanding the mathematics or only understanding the mathematics behind quantum mechanics as much as I do, but... You know, maybe I should do more. I did not want to end my life without having read War and Peace, and I'm really glad I did so. Uh, and I'm really glad I didn't end my life as ended before, you know, various things like that. So 
Um, so if we go to um, string theory, so here's so again, this is a place where people who are really good at mathematics and what my sense, the sense that I get in the world of physics is that the guys who do string theory have got one up on many of the physicists and that their mathematics is extraordinarily good. And I, and, and they, they're like, I mean, last thing, one of the things that I read, you know, there's like 500 different mod, um, uh, string theories that are consistent with the data. And I kind of came to the conclusion that um, the, the problem with, is that, that, we're, that it's not just that we can't make the tools to test these theories, it's that the nature of the universe is such that these things are happening on too small a scale for us to be ever be able to man measure or tell the difference. So there may be a kind of a, well, it's kind of like a, an event horizon and a, and a level of um, um, granularity as we go down into more, you know, beyond the atom, the quarks, there's, you know, where there's just nothing that we can use to measure it. There's no, no sight, no, um, what is the word? Uh, I'm not the opposite of theoretical, no practical experiment that we can do to differentiate. And that is just what did you, I guess it's coming down to. The universe is not obliged to give up its secrets. Hmm. And they're not. <laughs> so, so, and if the universe is not obliged to give up its secrets, uh, does it, do, can you hear a tree when it, if, if nobody's there to hear it? What is the underlying reality if, if there's no mm -hmm. physical process that can identify it for an observer? So, so let me go in the opposite direction of small. Let me go really big and, and show another uh, limitation that I, you know, observational cosmology is now already hitting, which is that the, the universe that we can observe has a finite size because the further, uh, the further away we look, the further we go into the past, and eventually we hit the um, cosmic microwave background, which is right up to the Big Bang. So the, the, the volume of the universe that we can see is finite simply because of our position in it, uh, of the, the light that has reached us uh, in time. And so there's a limited amount of sky that we can observe and make statistical measurements on. And so it may well be that there are theories that predict A and another theory that predicts B for the properties, say, of the co cosmic microwave background but that we don't have enough sky to observe. So the answer may just be forever out of our reach, simply because of something as, as simple as the scale of the universe. It's just too small. Our horizon is too small. Um, similarly, with the question of, is the universe merely very big or is it infinite? Now, again, we may one day have a theory that will let us test this in our finite horizon, but for now, all we can say it's bigger than our horizon because there's a limited amount that we can see. It may well be that the universe is finite in size. We just can't tell. It's beyond what we can see and what we can ever see. It's just, you know, I, 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 I'm just living with these issues every now and then when I read something or now sitting with you. But, you know, it's funny because what's coming to mind is that um, I, I, when I was a student, I had, it was a statistic that was regularly cited that one of the highest suicide rates was for mathematicians at Cambridge because of, I don't know why, but it was a challenging math course. And um, I'm just surprised that there isn't a high suicide rate for physicists because, because it, it just, because, because, um, you know, we, we have, we, we've grown up in our world, in our enlightenment world, that knowledge progresses, knowledge mass marches forward, and knowledge in all sorts of ways is progressing, but what we're talking about here is a demonstrable limit to the progress of knowledge. Um, and, and, you know, on the, on, the, on the small scale and on the big scale, where it's just like, we cannot know, end of story. That it's almost like you're getting to a place where it's provable that we cannot know, you know, and that's disturbing. <laughs> so, I, 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 I take it the I take a different position. It's essentially um, what's proposed by by David Deutsch, which is that uh, whatever is allowed by the laws of nature um, will eventually be possible and will be done. And I think we we have no idea yet where the limits of that are. And we're so far away from from 
uh, from being constrained by what the laws of nature allow us to do that for our lifetime and probably for the lifetimes of a lot of generations coming after us, it's actually a very optimistic perspective. It's optimistic from the perspective of universities, PhD students, plenty of work to do. But even if we just come up against a wall where we say there's something we'd like to know but it's provable that this is a wall for us, even though we know that there is likely to be something on the other side of it, even though there's plenty on our side of the wall to still discover and learn about, but we just know that we can't go through that part of the wall is, um, is, is I mean, yes, plenty to discover, but we, we found a wall, you know? So I think the, I'll take issue with the word provable because it's provable according to what we know about reality right now, what we believe the fundamental laws of nature are. We know that what we have right now is not a complete description of reality. So what may appear to be an insurmountable opt obstacle right now may not be once we've reached a deeper level of understanding. Yeah, and so you are open to that. Absolutely, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, somewhere, um, but we don't have to go into it when you, when you were talking about the limits of knowledge on the small, the limits of knowledge on the big, I kind of came up with, or the thought came up with Gödel's impossibility theorem. But um, just to, so let's leave that aside, because uh, there's just so many places we could dive into. Because another place that I would have loved to have di dove, dived into is this idea of symmetry and this incredible, and again, what I'm doing here, Kevin, for your interest, is that you've got a lay person who's curious who's struggling in his spare time to get some level of insight and understanding. And I'm trying to grapple with things I don't really understand. But but I realize that there is a... So there's a book that I have at home called Physics from Symmetry. And it turns out that so many of the rules of physics, at least according to the introduction to the book, which is as far as... Not just as far as I got, but as far as I could understand, because then it gets very quickly into things that I, for all sorts of reasons, can't understand. But, but they're kind of like derivable from simple, symmetrical, well, the laws of symmetry in that, you know, you can't have more than one object occupying one space. Or, um, you know, a thing has, if a thing goes around 360 degrees, it's turned upon itself. And, um, and that's just uh, an amazing thought for me. It's just a fascinating thought. I'm not sure why I'm saying this, but... I don't know if there's a response. I, I think it is probably one of the most amazing insights into physics and laws of nature that anyone's ever had. So this is uh, Noether's law, which is basically saying that conservation laws correspond to symmetry. And another way to say the same thing is to say that our dynamic understanding, our math mathematical uh, description of reality, like equations of motion, whatever, that they, are, that they correspond to geometry that those two things are deeply, fundamentally linked in some way that they're the same thing. Yeah, and that, that kind of points to a sort of deep structure of reality, which is the sort of like the place where I think that mathematicians maybe have a step up on physicists in that, although, you know, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of hesitating because where my mind is going is I want to dive into the monster set with you, but you know, I'm a... I'm living and walking proof that a that a, an ignoramus can ask more questions than any wise person can answer, and um, I I understand symmetry. If you take a square, you can turn it by ninety degrees, and it still looks like a square, and you know. And then I know that there the monster set with all its I don't know how many elements is a set is a symmetry set similar to that simple concept of a square. Exactly how that works, I have no idea. But I'm not going to go into it because we could just be diving into many things. So tell me from, uh, and so what from that to deciding to leave? Well, we didn't even get into. I, I um I feel like we should talk about Zooniverse and Universe, um, this sort of pop citizen science project. But before we go there, why don't you explain to me what? what would make somebody like you who's living in the world that we've just been occupying a little bit uh, to leave that world and what it feels like? What are the considerations? What made you decide to leave that world? 
So the the considerations uh, I, I, again, uh, kind of like all, all my previous life choices. I think it was partially random and partially just the obvious thing to do. So um, I, based on my experience of using technology in, in research, I uh, with my co-founder actually we we planned to to start a company to work on this project anyway, and it happened that at the time. Um, my my institute, my research institute was having significant trouble, and I said, r rather than than deal with all of this and, and and move, I don't know, back to the U.S. Or, or whatever, I will run this company. And I then said, I'm dedicating myself to that, and I find that is just as intellectually rewarding uh, as as everything I've done before. So um, we'll get into modulos, but. Um... Tell me about citizen science. What mm. got you involved in citizen science, and how does that fit into a more kind of academic viewpoint of the world? So, back when I was working on my PhD, I needed lots of examples of these two different types of galaxies: the spiral galaxies, like our Milky Way, and the early type galaxies. And uh, I had this amazing data set with. Um, something like a million galaxies. And I looked at all the different methods that were available at the time for classifying those images. And I compared them, and these were everything from back then what was called machine learning um, to just doing it myself. And, and I compared the methods, and I decided that um, the most efficient and actually also the most ac uh, accurate way to do this back then in 2007 was to do it by hand. So I sat down and I did 50,000 galaxies. 50,000? Yeah. OMG. Yeah, it gave me a bit of a headache. Yeah. Um, it was not fun, but it was worth doing. So I basically spent about a week, full week, seven days, in the office, morning till evening, you know, listening to music or uh, radio or whatever, just clicking early or late or early, late, you know, whatever came up on the screen. And when I was done with that, I, I did 50,000, so my experimental limit on how much a grad student will do. Um, I, I went and analyzed the data with that, and, and we could get some really cool results. And I realized it would be useful to do the whole million, but I'm not going to do it. It's, uh, it's just too much. And so we, we thought about this actually in a, in, a, in a pub in Oxford and said, like, why don't, why don't we just put this on the internet and see if maybe there's some amateur astronomers out there who would be interested in classifying some galaxies. And, and we did that. We called it the Galaxy Zoo. We put up a website and uh, put up the million galaxies um, on there. And people had a very simple user interface where they could click on buttons to help us classify galaxies. And we did some back of the envelope calculations of how long it would take people on the internet to do this. And we figured if every galaxy was viewed once, every one of the million, over the span of, I think, two or three years, we would be pretty happy. And we could just leave it running in the background. So we put up the website. And um, there was a BBC news story about us. It was the number two most emailed story on that day. Uh, we'd lost out narrowly to man flies to a wedding a year early. You can't beat that. Um, and so many people logged on that actually um, the server melted, and that's not a metaphor. A, a cable actually melted and <laughs> knocked us offline. So uh, we, we got it back online, and when we thought about what just happened, we realized there's this huge untapped potential uh, of people who wanted to do science, who wanted to contribute to it, who, who are not in any way employed as scientists or necessarily trained as scientists. Uh, these were called citizen scientists. and was sort of a niche subject at the time. There were some initiatives from NASA and other places to try and get the public involved in, in science. So we went with it, and it, you know, it, it grew very rapidly because people told us, like, this is great. I really enjoy doing this um, all the way to people saying, like, this is the coolest thing I can do all day. Um, and so we expanded from there. We, we tried to find new tasks for people to do. So Galaxy Zoo became the Zooniverse. And so... Uh, this uh, grew and grew and grew into more and more projects because then scientists came to us and said, I basically have the same problem as you. Here are my craters on Mars or here are my biological specimens or samples or whatever. Can you ask the public to classify them for me? And it, it, it basically went from there. It basically became a scientific facility. And, and last I checked, something like two, over 2 million people around the world uh, engaged in this. 
And, and it was amazing to see that happen. It was immensely gratifying. Yeah, I think that uh, there's a um, there's a there's a real I, I realize in this moment. So I went on, but it was after I'd met you, and I went and classified some galaxies. But I classified about ten, and then I and by the way, for the listener, it's it's not you know you you have you have a the, if I remember correctly, the the setup observes the person classifying the galaxies to check the accuracy rate. So. Uh, you want to make sure that the person's doing it correctly. So there's various cross-checking mechanisms, which is kind of itself an interesting um, uh, algorithm that you probably had to put together. But uh, I, I feel, I do, I, I can say that, uh, you know, somebody, a mutual friend of ours, Laura Bowdus, has dedicated her life to the discovery of dark matter, and it is a perplexing problem. And I think that, you know, it's, it's hard because I think that this may be a case where the universe is not just not going to give up its secrets. And, um, but there's clearly something there. And I don't know what the probability is that Laura will find something. She last time I checked, she was, uh, she'd just driven about a thousand kilometers to Grand Sasso to go into a place underneath a mountain where they have some very sensitive detection equipment where the theory tells them that if, if dark matter is one way to detect dark matter, but she lives with the very real possibility that she would have lived her whole life with no real results. And I think that um, the, the, the general public, you know, uh, sort of gets the extraordinary loneliness of doing that and the extraordinary, um, what a noble cause it is and wants to support it in a certain way. It's like, and so what you what you got there is kind of this desire to participate and giving people the b desire to participate is is so wonderful for so many reasons because we know that just simply psychologically getting somebody engaged in that way is more likely to have them support other scientific projects and so uh, I, I think you should be extraordinarily proud of that work and I would argue that as a public policy even if it was demonstrable that the that the scientific results were marginal, it would still be a very positive project to do because it gets people engaged in stuff that they ought to be engaged in. I mean, that's, that's really um, gratifying to hear. I mean, I would say that the, the, the record, the, the, the scientific studies and papers that, especially astronomers is what I know best, have done with the Galaxy Zoo data, the, the classifications supplied by the public, uh, that wasn't marginal. Those were, those were really interesting and profound studies that are as important as, as any other you know i find it interesting it, it reminds me that you know there, there are there are probably an infinite number of number series different types of series of numbers from series of prime numbers to and that in itself is a kind of process of classification and there's a there's the you know in another another version of my explorations with things that i know nothing about i have read books on the Riemann, Riemann zeta function. It turns out that the Riemann zeta function is just a subset of, I think it's Dirichlet functions. And there's a whole database of that, and it's up on the internet. So you can just go, you come up across a mathematical object, you can see what it is. And the idea is that we don't, under, you know, the, the Riemann hypothesis hasn't been proven, but one way of approaching it is to see it as a subset. Uh, you know, maybe there's something that we learn about a different branch of of that kind of zoo of uh, functions that will enable us. Anyway, it's kind of fascinating because there's a collaboration happening in all sorts of ways. But let's dive out of the academic before I go down yet another rabbit hole. <laughs> I'm perfectly capable of going down rabbit holes. Um, let's just go come into the practical world. So, and I I can see how because I before you came I spent some time. Uh, on the Modulos website, and I can see how, I mean, in a certain way, the jump from having citizen scientists classifying galaxies to having an artificial intelligence classifying either galaxies or the example on your website is cancer tumors or not. Uh, tell me about Modulos, how it started and what it seeks to do. So uh, when, when I was trying to decide how to classify those galaxies uh, in 2007, I, I dismissed machine learning. It just, it wasn't there. It wasn't ready to, to be useful for research. So then about a, 
almost a decade elapsed, so 2015, 2016, I started re-engaging with the topic, and it was essentially with the, the rise of deep learning as a useful technology. Uh, I got really fascinated by it, and I basically just almost stopped reading astrophysics, and all I read was computer science. And I basically got a team of students and postdocs together and said, like, let's use this technology, it's really cool, Let, let's do some science with it. And we were able to, uh, to take the technology and do some some really cool initial studies, you basically proof of concept, you, you, you can do these things. But it was really hard. It was really hard to use the tools that the computer scientists had built. And so there's a time that I started working with, with my co-founder, Tse Zhang. He's a, he is a computer scientist and he works on systems for machine learning. So how do, how do people, uh, basically I was his user. We started collaborating and we actually gave him access to our Slack channel where we complained about all the problems and error messages that, that we had. And uh, he had a revelation, which is that um, the technology that he and his community had built for machine learning was unusable even by ETH physicists. Right? What was the point? I, I, he wrote a paper and I, I'm trying to quote the sentence. I don't remember it exactly, but something to the effect of what's the point of building all this if people like these guys can't use it? And just to step, take a step back to make sure that we're on the same page. So. We're talking about image recognition and classification, um, galaxies or tumors. We're, we're talking about basically any machine learning task. So image classification is one of them, but it could be just dealing with numbers. It could be dealing with time series. We also did these experiments with uh, generative models where we basically try to um, use machine learning systems being trained to, to run these thought experiments. So one paper that I thought was, was extremely cool that, that we published, um, uh, we used a technology that had been developed by Facebook and others to try and learn what does it mean for a human face to age. So you would train this neural network with uh, human faces and you would tell them this person is 18, this person is 56. Then what you could do with that neural network, you could tell it now take this face and age it, change the age. Like the person is 34, now I wanna see what they look like at 24. And it could do this actually even back then with remarkable fidelity. And so we said, okay, uh, aging or de-aging faces is cool for Facebook. What will we do with this? And so we said, let's take scientific data, in this case, galaxies. We took images of galaxies. And then we took other physical quantities that we had measured about these galaxies, like the rate of star formation, or whether they're in a galaxy cluster or in the field and said, let's take the neural network and let's turn all these properties into, into like sliders or dials so we could dial up and down. And, and then we could use this basically as a, as a way to, to generate scientific hypotheses and see whether they make sense or not. And we thought this was extremely powerful. And yeah, but so hang on, you talked about, you, so you introduced so machine learning. Again, it's, you know, think of me and machine learning a bit like me and quantum mechanics. You know, there's kind of like a very mm -hmm. limited real understanding there. Then you brought in neural networks. And again, there's a limited understanding there. But, um, uh, and, you, and you talked about neural networks. Well, neural networks and machine learning is effectively the same thing. It's just neural network is, well, it's a way of programming a machine to learn about stuff. And there's a whole bunch of parameters that one can get into there, as I understand. But... Um, you talked about creating a model of aging, basically, and then using that model to predict how a face would age. So this is what uh, what people had done before. This yeah. is why they built it. They basically wanted to change the face on uh, the age on human faces, and we repurposed it. We trained it on galaxies, right. and instead of age, we used uh, other properties of the galaxies and said, um, if we take this galaxy that's in the field. Um, what would the neural network say it looks like if it was in a cluster? And then check that against the real images and see if, if, we, we, if we have a working hypothesis for how those changes happen or not. I'm just curious, if we just go back to the aging face, which is something that I can think about. So um, what I've learned about, and this is from doing a Coursera, like listening to a few lectures on a Coursera course, is that... Um, if you get too many nodes on a neural network, the computing, because it just becomes too much computing power is necessary in order to make it wieldy, to make it useful. 
But you could have a neural network that just in, as a, on the basis of time parameter shifts certain points on the face. But then you could have, you could have some kind of uh, model of aging that goes into something much more profound that you'd have to train on a far larger data set or maybe give it some internal models to train on. Um, what am I trying to say? I guess, you know, we, um, I, I guess what I'm telling you is that I know very little about neural networks, but uh, the, the neural network could be doing something very basic, mm -hmm. like just observing the movement of, uh, of nodes on a face, or it could be doing something far more profound, which is kind of like, you know, looking at the changing bone structure, mm -hmm. but you'd have to train it on far more data or maybe train it in a completely different way for it to develop that model. In fact, if you were going to get it to have a better model, uh, training it just on observation wouldn't work as well as just telling the machine, look, this is the model that we want you to use. Am I making any sense to you, first of all? I, I, I think so. And I, actually, that was the whole goal of taking this approach to... To, to not go this route of essentially telling the model what it is you want the answer to be uh, and just having it figure it out for itself to, to do it without our biases and preconceptions right. uh, built in. Which is the idea of machine learning and neural networks. Yes, and, and it's, but it's hard. It's, it's hard both, as you said, you, you need the right data. It's hard computationally and, and it's hard to build and control these systems and know whether they behave as you think they do or not. So um, in any case, he, your friend has a, um, a program. Is there a name to the program? No, so this is the, the, the challenge we had. There is no single program for this. There's a bunch of frameworks. This is like programming languages in which you can just build these systems. Or at least that was the case at the time. And, and they were extremely unwieldy and difficult to use with often absolutely cryptic error messages and um, his observation about what we were doing was that we, we did not get stuck in sort of the big conceptual questions like, like the questions that you have. We were getting stuck with silly technical issues. Like? Error messages that made no sense to us that we Googled and tried to figure out. And uh, uh, his reaction to that was, why are we building all these systems if smart people like those physicists right. can't even use them? And, and sorry for somebody who's not uh, neither a physicist nor a mathematician nor a computer scientist. When he's building these systems, what, what um, you know, I guess I have to ask what programming language is he using? What computer systems is he using? What are the inputs? What are the outputs? So the, there's a sort of list of common machine learning frameworks that people use. Um, there's, for example, this TensorFlow. There are I've heard of TensorFlow. PyTorch, right. things like that. Then uh, things on top of it like uh, Keras, which is sort of a, a higher level of abstraction. So it's uh, simpler to use, but it's still um, it's powerful, but it's unwieldy to use. And so um, his, his, his reaction was that um, Machine learning was at a point where other parts of computer technology were a long time ago. So the analogy we came up with was, uh, it's a bit like data storage systems. So 30, uh, 40, 50 years ago, if you wanted to store some data, if you were a bank or an insurance or a research institute, um, you could build a data storage system. It was really hard. You got a bunch of really smart people. You paid them a lot of money. And they built these custom systems with their deep knowledge of statistics and mathematics. Um, and every time you wanted a new operation, like merge columns or something, they had to spend time and, and effort um, making sure that those operations could be done safely. And then computer scientists looked at this and said, this, this, all this effort is, uh, is, is wasted, like this should be easier to do. And so they invented the database. So now if, if you want to store some data, you, you don't think about statistics and mathematics, you download a free or paid version of the software and you run it and you just implicitly trust that the underlying operations, the, the math and the, uh, the statistics, that that's done correctly. That you can just read the, um, the manual and learn what the, the syntax is and then you run your operations. Right. And we decided that we had to do the same thing for machine learning. Right. 
And so you, and maybe another way to think about it is that you, um, if, uh, if, um, if the tools like PyTorch and TensorFlow are kind of like the reptilian brain, you need a kind of a, a, a sort of a neocortex floating on top of it to interface to the real world, which will use all of those things. And we see that happening. I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, if we just think of what, um, Bill Gates did with Windows. I mean, I remember the first computers I used just had a command prompt. And then, you know, and it was actually really surprising because it was like, at first I remember people saying, well, who needs this stupid visual stuff? I can just clack away at a command prompt. And, you know, it's amazing when I stop and think I was writing about it yesterday. Um, uh, Lotus 123 XL, the early version of XL and VisiCalc, didn't use a mouse. You just mm -hmm. had the slash key. The slash key was the most important key, slash command key. And and I remember Excel coming along thinking, this is kind of, it's not very, you know, it's like, it's like leave me alone with the mouse. I just want to be on the keyboard. But now, you know, it's pretty normal to work with Excel and VisiCalc and Lotus 1, 2, 3 are non-existent. So in a certain way, you're kind of constructing that layer. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, that that that's exactly the the approach we're taking. That we we should when you when you, people tell you today that they're using machine learning in in in, in their work, be it research or, or whatever, they'll tell you it's like oh I I built this type of deep learning system and I used this framework and and I experimented with the layers and the dropout and and it's like this handcrafted piece of of intellectual pursuit that m may be beautiful but. Um, you have no idea if it's actually uh, optimal, and you have you you spent maybe five or six months building this this artifact, um, and you still don't necessarily know whether it's actually going to solve your problem. Yeah. And we want to move away from even needing people to do that to somebody who says like, I know my data, I know my problem, I know my subject, I know what's right and wrong. All I care about in this case is a forecast or a prediction or whatever. I actually don't care what kind of neural network is underneath it. I care that it's good. I care that it has the performance that I need. Right. Um, it you know obviously the obvious one obvious analogy is uh, the famous case of Mr. Levi who who during the gold rush realized that everybody wanted genes, and I actually and so he supplied genes, uh, genes as in J E A N S not G E N E S. Uh, but it also makes me think of uh, Amazon in that uh, all of this cloud computing that they now sell mm -hmm. was originally developed to take care of their own needs. But what they did, and what you're you're what you're hinting at for me at least, is that as you develop tools to solve your specific problem, you can dive down a rabbit hole. And we've been down mm -hmm. many rabbit holes. You can see how much I enjoy going there. But you can also potentially be like Jeff Bezos, in which you don't dive down a rabbit hole. You develop a tool that will solve your problem, but is also now applicable to many, many other use cases. And I guess that's effectively what you're doing. And I, and so what I want to segue for for the listeners' interest, Kevin just nodded at me, so I feel like I can keep going. He fi I finally said something that Kevin can agree with and made sense to him, and he's been politely as I've been meandering around you know, um, uh, tensors and uh, string theory, he's like doing his best to politely try and understand what I'm saying. Uh, but it, it seems to me then that the one of the keys that you have to do at Modulos is find those kind of key anchor clients who both, when you develop a tool for them that will work for their use case, it's also generally applicable, if you like, if that makes sense. That I completely agree. So we we're, we basically are building the tool that we wish had when we were trying to do science um, to to do it rapidly, to try out things, to build things, to see what works, and to 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 do it automatically. And so we decided that when when we said this is actually a really cool idea, this is something that anybody could use. What what is required? Well, it has to be general. And so we said right from the beginning that when we build this tool uh, at Modulus that it will be completely general. They have no, what we would call, domain knowledge in it. We'll do the machine learning, and we'll do it really, really well. And then all the expertise that goes around the use case 
this comes from the user. And so we thought about how do we prompt the user to give us that information and to, to translate it into constraints or machine learning language so that um, they can impose their view of their own subject in such a way um, that they control the situation. So I'm thinking though of, uh, uh, so um, help me if I'm in the right direction or in a good direction or not. Um, I could imagine that the business plan is along the lines of find a client for who, who's having the same trouble you had with the software, but now you've got the guy who wrote the software and you've got other people. And so, you know, I don't know, imagine it's the IBM laboratory. For one reason or another, they have something that they want to buy from, or that they, they're happy to have an external team do it. And the, the agreement with IBM in this example would be, we'll develop this for you and we'll give you the tools to make it easy for you to do this. But then we, we reserve the right to repurpose these tools in a more general way to make many other, to enable many other people to do a similar thing with their own data. Am I making sense? So we, we never want to touch anyone's data. Uh, if somebody has a use case that requires us to add a new type of machine learning model or a, a model that anyway has a general applicability, we will simply add it if that's what it takes to, to win that person as a customer. Um, but the data never comes to our system. We never train on customers' data and then re repurpose that. Yeah. Uh, it's really important to us that 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 we don't do that. That um, the customer's data or the user's data stays with the user, including in a secure environment, if that's what it takes. Right. But the tools, yes, the tools that, that that kind of these. So I'm thinking of you know I'm thinking of the guy who went down a rabbit hole and developed some very very specific solutions to his particular use mm -hmm. case of TensorFlow or Pi, PyTorch, yes. Keras. But then you're sort of thinking of, okay, how do I create a tool that solves this problem, but I now can take to, take to other places and you can use it there as well. So we, we want to generalize even stronger. And, and I would make the argument in many cases that this person who built this exquisite intellectual construct of a, of a model, um, that they're trying to do something that is, is something that actually we as humans shouldn't do. So if you think about some huge neural network with uh, dozens of layers and different types of connections. Uh, this is basically a model that has hundreds of parameters that you can tweak. And so this is the equivalent of saying is like, I know that if I tweak this one of the 700 parameters and then this one and then this one, that I get better performance. That's actually not something that humans can do. It's a 700 dimensional object. That's um, in statistics, that's called overspecified. Yeah. yeah. So instead of trusting that expert to do that slowly by hand, we completely automate it so that the computer automatically, with a search algorithm, optimizes that structure. The structure of the neural network. Yeah. In terms of the number of nodes and the number of layers. Whatever it is. And, and potentially the, the way those layers respond to each mm -hmm. other. Including also, if it's not a neural network, it's a different type of model, that the same logic applies, right? Because, so you might be trying to solve a problem and you think, based on your experience or your biases, that a neural network is the best solution here. What if it's not? Have you tried all the others? Have you done so systematically? And so, you know, we, we're diving into, I, I feel, technical knowledge that um, you know, I could spend two years studying and still not pretend, well, maybe in this case, I have a better likelihood of doing that than understanding string theory, but but neither are particularly good. But so, so why don't we just go to a sort of like a relatively high level? Um, how long have you been doing it? How's it going? Where? What's the ro roadmap look mm -hmm. like? So we we started the company about uh, more than two years ago. We we started really hiring engineers about a year and a half ago. Uh, we spent about the the last um, yeah year and a half uh, building the platform. It's now ready and we're, we're, we're approaching uh, first customers. It's already running in some research institutions, so researchers are using it for their work. Um, that's also what we originally, you know, our own use case that, that we came up with. And um, the roadmap is uh, that we actually want to go much further than simply building models, but that we want to be uh, 
able to also help people who, who really use the models put them live. So uh, we worked out the math for a bunch of really interesting things of suppose you're a big online store and you have a recommender system trying to tell you, you know, what, what should you recommend to your customers. Your revenue really depends on it. Like each tick of performance is, is really valuable to you. You're not going to experiment live and saying, here's a new model that our, our development team came up with. Let's just see what happens. Um, we're trying to come up with a system so that all these models are being generated by, by our platform, then are systematically checked in a, in a sensible way whether or not it's safe to put them online. And similarly, if the, 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 the data flow changes, if the user behavior changes or whatever it is, that you get prompts saying, look, the model that you thought was good probably isn't anymore, you should, you should switch. That we go not just uh, into this, uh, this uh, DevOps mode for, for machine learning, so, um, you know, um, I, I, as you were talking, I was sort of, it, it's, it's fascinating to me how, you know, well, as the universe expands, there's so much to explore within the crack, so to speak, and there's so much. So I, where I want to go with this is uh, to something super current for today, um, the algorithms behind TikTok. Mm -hmm. So I was explaining to... David, whom you just met, that uh, my rule with TikTok is like computer games on my work PC. I figured out 20 years ago that I couldn't even have chess because I'd pull up some chess and two hours later I'm deep into some game with somebody. It's not going to work very well for me if I want mm -hmm. to get real work done. TikTok, I will open it, look at it because I want to check out what my children are seeing and then I'll delete it again because it's so extraordinarily addictive. And I read Ben Thompson, um, he has a website called Stratechery, fantastic website. He talks about how you know, every single other social media platform it has got some version of tagging going on um, in which you know, it's words and tags around pictures, but it's not analyzing videos and pictures in and of themselves. And the algorithm behind TikTok is that it'll analyze your view, your viewing time where you stop watching an image, and it will analyze features in the image. And I presume there's some pretty extraordinary machine learning going on in there. Um, well, I guess, first of all, can you explain a little bit what you understand about the technology behind that? And uh, um, does it bother you? I mean, start mm -hmm. with, or start with, take me from what you've understood of what I've understood of it, mm -hmm. and, and elaborate, help me to understand, to get somewhere close to what your understanding of it is. Right. So, so a company like TikTok, or YouTube, or Facebook, or any of these companies, what, what they depend on is engagement. They want to make sure your eyeballs are on the website and stay there. So every second they, they can get you to stay longer to them is, is valuable. And so what they do is they get the, the smartest people of our generation to think deeply about how to maximize um, you staying and continuing to look at their website or their service. And what they do is they collect all the data they possibly can to then uh, build a model that um, tells the website or the service what to show you next. So. If you've watched this video to the end, clearly you, you, you liked what you did. What should I now show you as the next thing so that you continue? And then what is the next thing I should show you so you stay? And so they learn from your behavior, from other people's behavior. They uh, add all that data together and they build the most sophisticated, most complex machine learning models to optimize that probability. Uh, of you continuing to stay on the website. And, and what's worth saying is that they're analyzing, you know, uh, obviously where in the video I stopped watching, mm -hmm. where in the video I flicked, uh, if I watch the video again, uh, to the extent that they had eyeball data, they mm -hmm. would probably want to analyze where in the image I'm looking. But they're also, if I understand correctly, analyzing the image itself. Does mm -hmm. it have, and then I think that what is, what is, kind of like mind-boggling for me and is kind of a new thing is that because it's machine learning they they don't know what 
it, it, the algorithm predicts it through the um, through a model that is not even specified by humans. So it's not mm -hmm. like you can come and say, we know that this is the right video to show this person uh, because this person likes the color red. Mm -hmm. It's the, the, the model predicts for reasons that we don't know that this is the thing to show next. I'm not sure I agree on the we don't know the reason. You can in interrogate these systems and give you answers maybe at a level that wouldn't satisfy you because it, it will just be tons of correlation coefficients to certain properties of yours. So it wouldn't be a clean answer because you like the color red. I don't, I don't think that's possible. Um, but there, you can interrogate these models and find out. But, but, but it's not necessary because, no. because the, you've, got, you've got a bunch of um, creators creating content. You're analyzing that content and just deciding. So it's not really necessary. You just want to optimize that mm -hmm. process. That's exactly right. And you asked me if I'm, if I'm bothered by it. And I, and I am because it, it's like the classic example of um, the, the, the Zauberlehrling. It's like you, you summon the magic machine and it does exactly what you ask it to do. So in this case, the engineers at these companies said, maximize the probability that the user stays on the website. That is our only goal. And it's exactly what the machine did to perfection, to whatever is possible with the data, yeah. they did it. And, and this is well-known effect that many people have now highlighted, for example, on YouTube. Um, if you start watching YouTube videos and they're political, that the way to keep you engaged is to show you progressively more extreme content. So one day you're, you're watching a clip from MSNBC and before you know it, you're in extreme left-wing territory. Um, and what we've learned from that is that the way to keep you on the website is to keep making the content we show you more extreme, yeah. to drive you to more and more outlandish things. And by the way, that is an example of the, the, the machine figures something out. We don't necessarily have to understand it, but there is a mm. human uh, relatable way of understanding what the machine has figured out. And I, I, this is something that I've, you know, I had one opportunity to have, to have to sit around a table with Eric Schmidt, but I know that he wouldn't take this on board. And, and I don't know how you convince this to legislators, but intuitively, I feel like um, that information about me that the machine is finding out ought to be something that I can... Um, that it ought to be something that I'm allowed to be notified of or to actually that. So the metadata about me ought to be under my control. So this famous example that, you know, Facebook predicted from some girl's uh, Facebook behavior that she was about to have a baby and gave that mm -hmm. information to a marketing company that ended up sending her some baby gifts. And the parent opened the gifts and they're like, or they opened the package and they're like, what the hell? And this was all happening through prediction. It wasn't like the mm -hmm. daughter had told the parent. And this was a kind of invasion of privacy that the um, I should own that. And in an ideal world, what I would love to see, and it's easy to describe it, and it, we know that it's right, is that um, YouTube or TikTok would come to me and say, we've now observed you for the last X amount of time. And we can, we can say with X amount of certainty, the following things about you, how do you want, what do you want now? So first of all, it's information. Based on the videos that you're watching, you're likely to come out in this extreme end of the political spectrum, or you're most likely a democratic voter, or you're most likely to mm. be a wife beater, or you're likely to be depressed. Many different things that they might know. Uh, and then what would you like to do about it? So for example, on the political spectrum, it's almost like you'd want to be able to say that you are YouTube, you are obliged uh, to not show more extreme content. In fact, mm -hmm. you're obliged to show balanced content. So if somebody is starting to lean on any one of these spectrums in one direction, you're obliged to show them counter evidence. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's looking at Holocaust denial videos, every second video has to be a video refuting Holocaust denial. They can't just keep going down that. Uh, blind alley, if you like, but that is just I am describing now a utopia yeah. that is that is so far away from anything that we've got, isn't it? I completely agree, and it's 
it, it, it's not in say just to pick on YouTube here it's not in their interest to do that because the algorithms already told them that the most profitable thing for them to do is to keep showing you more extreme things so I, I think the only you know if there were legislation uh, legislation would be the only way to to enforce that the machine has told YouTube exactly what uh, what they asked them to, which is what is the most profitable thing for yeah. us to do. I mean, this it, it's so strange because this gets way beyond, um, you know, this is not about Google becoming a more valuable company. This is actually about what we're doing with our mm -hmm. civilization. And to take a simple, you know, just to, go, to relate it back to me, um, I don't want the cookie jar within reach. I want it on the top shelf where I have to climb on a stool to get it. I don't want, you know, just uh, internet chess. Mm -hmm. on my computer because I'll end up playing three hours of internet chess. Uh, um, we don't, we have to, and it's a public policy thing. We just, we, I don't, I don't know what we're going to do because it's scary. <laughs> it, it is. And it's basically what, what, what's scariest to me about it is that some people are now clearly able to build systems that are so good uh, so good at catching our attention and wasting it on what is profitable for them that it, it throws up really fundamental questions about our, are we in control of our, our lives, our opinions, our views. And the, all of this is done in companies. It's not done in universities. So we have no idea what's effective, what works, what doesn't. Um, I mean, one of the, the most fascinating tech stories of the last few years is the whole question of Cambridge Analytica and their claim that they can swing elections. And it's sort of just been accepted point blank that they can. And the alternative explanation that they're basically scamsters um, has not been evaluated. And we probably will never know the answer to that because these are not experiments that any scientist could ever run, both practically and ethically. It's, you know, I, I would just tell you that somebody who I'm close to in my family that I've discovered, you know, when we're in the run up. Uh, to the 2020 presidential election and this person's views it's not that their views are more extreme but I think that they are surprisingly extreme for somebody who 10 years ago wasn't particularly politically engaged it's this intense sense of anger and mm -hmm. I stop and think about this person's life and I, I just know that 10 years ago they would not have been so angry mm -hmm. and I think that I'm, I'm barely holding on because you know, I'm the, the guy. The guy who started me on this was Tristan Harris, I think, and he he kind of explained it very well. And now, uh, my wife recently watched the Social Dilemma on Netflix, so it's starting to come to com conscious knowledge. But but what we know is simply knowing about it doesn't mean that we're not impacted by it. Um, yeah, right. And it it sort of go, goes back to this point about whether it's effective. So. Are these systems, are they actually making us more extreme in a direction that maybe isn't already innate to us? Or are they simply reinforcing what's already there? And, and to me, it is not obvious if it, um, uh, wh which way this goes. Like, is it really possible to persuade somebody into a radical opinion that they wouldn't have otherwise held um, simply by showing them uh, videos or Facebook posts or whatever? It's it's an it's an open question to me, and what bothers me the most is that we'll we, we will never know the truth about this because yeah. the people who know, if they if they admitted that it was all a scam, that there's no way they can do it, I mean their business would collapse. Yeah, I actually don't think it's a scam. I think that uh, I feel like I have enough anecdotal evidence to be deeply suspicious of what these technologies mm -hmm. are doing, um, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. It's sort of scary to see what happens i would tell you that in time i i i got to a revelation that i'm writing about a memo for myself and for friends right now about how um so i've stopped using and this is just a simple thing but a bit like put the cookie jar out of reach uh take the computer games and take them off the mm -hmm. computer but um i am no longer using so so uh websites like Amazon make it so easy to add things to the wish list. Mm -hmm. So I don't want Amazon to control my wish list. I want to control um, the list of things that I save for read later, for example. 
I want to control that as much as possible. And I, I consciously start and end my day not in front of the computer. And I've started actually using as a series of reminders in physical index cards because I control that environment. And, and the minute we get into an environment where things are being thrown up in front of our eyes is when we've lost control. And even if we think we're in control, we're not in any case. That's a long story. I want to end on one last sort of, you know, thankfully it's not string theory or quantum theory, but you're somebody who knows the UK very well. You're somebody who knows Switzerland very well. Um, now that's all we could we could do an hour on that, but but just uh, I guess and really it's just to, to close to close down what could go on for a very long time, um, uh, and I guess I'd I'd just put the question to you like this: uh, if you if you lived in the UK, what would you le miss the most about Switzerland? What would you miss least? And if now that you live in Switzerland, what, is, what do you miss most and what do you miss the least? And I guess, uh, just to make it clear, um, um, so, so <laughs> the, the reason why I'm asking the question is, not to, is, is to elicit what is most instructive for the audience mm -hmm. or for, for people listening. So um, it's not so much what you actually would miss the least, but what is most salient and what, what makes the difference. And I guess, I don't know, you can, mm -hmm. you've heard it, so now you can sort of range over that territory. So if, if I left uh, the UK for Switzerland, I think what I, what I would miss the most is um, the sense of wit, the sense of, of culture, the sense of intellectual pursuit that, I mean, especially in Oxford, of course, was very strong, but also in other places. like. British people have a way of looking at the world that that I, I find very positive, that I find very helpful. It's it's a little bit fatalistic. It's a little bit, um, you know, taking it as it comes. But I, I found that very good. And Switzerland were very earnest. What I what I would miss the least about the UK is this 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 navel gazing sense of we we are still the center of the world when the last decade or two have really shown that no, the, the UK is no longer the center of the world in, in, in many ways and um, they've deliberately distanced themselves from the center of culture and influence and and and, and the economy in, in actually very deliberate va ways and I find that very painful to see. Um, what I will miss most about Switzerland if I move back to the UK is uh, we, we have a a very strong demand for things to work. It's, it's, we have a very low tolerance for um, especially the government, but also other things um, being extremely reliable. Like people here get nervous if the train is more than a minute or two late. Uh, that's not true in the UK. Uh, you're, you're lucky if the replacement bus service is there. Um, I would really, I would miss that because I think it leads to, to an environment at a very basic level that makes Switzerland extremely livable. What I miss the least is the, the, the counterpart to that, which is the, 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 the small-mindedness sometimes, like the, 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 the sense we're, we're just a tiny little village, we have a chip on our shoulder, um, we, uh, um, we, we don't actually like change, we're conservative, but in a, in a, in a, in a, in a small village sense. Yeah, I think that I would miss yeah. the least. Yeah, it's interesting. I, for your interest, I mean, it's a. Uh, I think that two things that come out of what you said for me, and that sort of resonated for me, is on the Swiss side, it's the earnestness, and earnestness can be can be a little. Uh, well, it becomes onerous when it becomes too, übertrieben. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, yeah. uh, overemphasized. But but what comes out for me in the UK, is the fatalism. The sense that there's no point even trying, or there's no point. Let's just laugh about it, and and it, it it's great to have a sense of humor, but sometimes it's good to take yeah. something earnestly and damn well get it done. Yeah, and uh, it's fascinating because now uh, I'm increasingly, even though I grew up there, I was pretty disconnected, and now I'm becoming far more connected to the UK. I think that for what it's worth, um, uh, and I think that increasingly will more and more of us will be able to do it. I think that. Uh, we can build rich lives around basing ourselves in one or maybe even more places. And 
um, because of what we need is good connectivity. And that's not just uh, internet connectivity, it's also physical connectivity, which we're all missing right now. But um, I, I love living in Switzerland, uh, but, I, but I, I don't feel an obligation to engage. So people ask me, but don't you find it boring, they will say. Mm -hmm. And what I say is that, you know, I lived in New York and there were these awesome firefighters who were often from an Irish background. I'm really glad that they were there, but you know, I didn't have to engage with them. And the, for example, around Zurich University and ETR, there are some extraordinary people who, who live, you know, we might physically be present in Switzerland, but we, we don't actually live in Switzerland. We live in kind of a global community. And I think it, what a difficulty for me when I spend time in the UK is I feel to have to engage with all the negatives of the UK. When I'm here in Switzerland, I don't feel any obligation to engage with the negatives of Switzerland. Um, so I'm going to share one last word, and then I'm going to give you a kind of a, a last word. I think that it would be too far to say that it's a tragedy, but I think that uh, the United States and the United Kingdom are both colonial cultures or exporters of culture. And I think that they often they are so busy exporting culture and their way of doing things. And the world has eagerly taken on many aspects of what the United States and the United Kingdom have done. But the United States and the United Kingdom are not so good at looking inwards and fixing what is wrong. Uh, by contrast, Switzerland has been superlative, I think, at looking inwards and saying, you know, fix your own house before you try and fix somebody else's house. There are so many things that work so well here. And it is just remarkable to me that you can travel, you can fly an hour and a half to the UK and so many solutions that would be applicable in the UK, for example, from Switzerland, they have no interest because they're so busy exporting stuff. And by the way, the Swiss mindset is the same. It's like the Swiss will solve problems all the way up to their border. And beyond their border, by and large, don't take responsibility for understandable reasons. And that, that is just, it's not a tragedy, but it's something I would love to find a way to fix if I could. Because I think the world would benefit so much from Swiss wisdom that it doesn't. But that's my last word. It's, it's a real pleasure. I'll give you a last kind of monologue to, to say anything that you want to say to whoever decides to listen to this I mean, ranging I, I, discussion. I think this was a really interesting conversation because it, it, it meandered in, in very, very different areas. But I think... Uh, um, I'm trying to see if there's a, a, a general theme, and, and if there is one, it's this, that you, you, you can look at all these different problems, all these different uh, questions, and you can lead yourself easily astray if you're, if you're not on the, the right level of abstraction of the problem. If you go too much into detail, you, you, you don't see it. If you, if you zoom too far out, you, you don't see it. And so what, what I will try to keep in mind um, as a consequence is to really in every conversation, every problem, um, to make sure I try to be on the right level of it. That's interesting. And I, I'll just share with you that this for me has been a wonderful indulgence because I rarely get to talk to minds like yours. And I really get to, and, and it's just a wonderful pleasure for me. And I would tell you that I don't feel like I have the right to take your time to indulge, meander all over the place. But I actually wanted to use this podcast as an opportunity to indulge and actually explore many things that otherwise we wouldn't have. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for joining me. Thank you for having me.